So welcome. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am one of the co-founders of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, and we're hosting this reading with Shani Mutu and John Elizabeth Stensi. Um, normally, we would be hosting this in our lovely space in uh, the LGBT Community Center. Um, but there's a little pandemic going on right now, so <laughs> we're all at home on our computers. Um, but we're really happy that we have that capacity to do that. And uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the Bureau is a queer bookstore that my partner Donnie Jokum and I started in 2012 in New York City. And since 2014, we've been at the LGBT Community Center uh, in Manhattan. And that's where we still reside, even though we're not physically there now. Um, and we did just launch an online bookstore, which we're super excited about, especially in these times. And we've added uh, Shawnee's most recent book and John Elizabeth's most recent book on there. And we'll continue to be adding a lot of books on there. So um, please spread the word. Uh, it will continue to grow. Right now it's kind of a small selection, but we'll, we'll keep it growing. Um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, we're recording this event and we will post it on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you know of anyone who's missed it, uh, they can definitely go there and, and all of that will be posted on our website as well. So that's it for me, aside from, uh, I guess I should also say we have more upcoming virtual events. So please do check out the website. Um, with some great authors and uh, activists and others that are in the works. So we're looking forward to those. Um, so I'm going to introduce our readers, speakers tonight, and then we're going to get started. And uh, I just want to do speaker view. There we go. Okay. So John Elizabeth Stinsey is a non-binary novelist and poet. They were the recipient of the 2019 RBC Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers. And their work has appeared in Kenyan Review, the Malahat Review, and Plowshares. They are the author of the novel Vanishing Monuments, as well as the poetry collection June Bat. And Shani Mutu is a novelist, poet, and visual artist. Her novels include Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and shortlisted for a Lambda Literary Award, Valmiki's Daughter, long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, He Drowned She in the Sea, long listed for the Dublin Impact Award, and Sirius Blooms at Night, shortlisted for several prizes, including the Giller Prize, and long listed for the Man Booker Prize. Uh, she is also a recipient of a Chalmers Arts Fellowship and the Dr. James Duggan's Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Prize. Her latest novel, Polar Vortex, has just been longlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. So please welcome them both. And I also wanted to say, if you have any questions for uh, either Shawnee or John Elizabeth, you can post them in the chat function, um, and I will make sure that they get read and addressed. <laughs> So, John and Shani, welcome. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, so Shani, are you going to read for us off the top? Just like sure, just introduce I'll do that. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say um, thanks very much to the Bureau and to Greg, and of course to, um, to, to the Bureau and to Greg Farm for hosting this, and to Akashic, my publisher, and uh, Johnny Temple. Um, and I'm really glad this is the second book I'm doing with Akashic and I'm very, very happy to be with them. And I'm so glad to see, uh, to, to be doing this with, uh, with John Elizabeth. I'm very, very pleased about that. And um, thank you. I can see my friends, uh, Sheila and Mary and um, Maureen and uh, there's Hazel. Very, very nice to, um, to have you all uh, on this. So I'm going to read a little bit from um, the beginning of Polar Vortex. And um, this is, uh, Polar Vortex is written in two voices. Um, from Priya's 
point of view and also from Alex's point of view. And um, Priya has just invited an old friend to come to visit um, her and Alex. Alex has never heard of this friend, okay? And Alex is, um, Priya is trying to hide a little bit of what her relationship with Prakash was like. So, okay. I'm certain it wouldn't have been wise to have told Alex during these last few days that yes, Prakash had at one time, but only briefly, been interested. She knows little about the years that immediately followed my immigration to Canada once my university tenure had been completed. There's just never been any reason to get into the details with her of those early days in this country. I'd found lodging in city subsidized housing in Toronto. And Prakash and I, we hadn't lost touch with each other, but we weren't as close as we were before. I'd embarked on a practice of art making as diligently as anyone pursuing any other kind of career. But of course, I wasn't making any money at it, always running out of paint and canvas. And I, I couldn't afford to pay any of my bills. My kitchen cupboards tended to be empty, save for cans of ravioli and packages of ramen. Prakash arrived at my apartment one day, unannounced, just after I'd hung up from a phone call with a family member back home, who responded to my appeals for financial help, perhaps one time too many, advising that I get an ordinary job like normal people or return at once and marry a man who could take care of me while I pursued my hobby, as they called it. Seeing the state that I was in, Prakash held my face in his hands and whispered earnestly, your greatness as an artist is being heralded in this very moment. Others can't see it, but I can. Do you trust me? Let me help you. We can do this together. I was curious and my protests were weak and he easily brushed them away as he carried on with his mission. He tore a sheet of paper from the drawing pad on my dining table and pulled a pen from his shirt pocket and handing it to me directed me to itemize the sums of my rent, utilities, groceries, paints, canvas and everything else I needed to see me through a month's living. Then he asked me to write down my income. I drew an egg and while I shaded it in, cross hatching with his blue ink pen, he went to one of the several stacks of paintings leaning against a wall and flipped through it. He pulled out a small canvas board on which I'd made a study in oil of two green glass bottles and a clear one on a tabletop in front of a window through which blue skies topped an emerald green field. He didn't ask, but announced he was taking it in exchange for the sum of that month's needs, which he said would one day, probably after I died, he added laughing, be seen to have been a bargain. And that was the first painting I ever sold. And I made it through that first month. After that, I sort of fell little by little into him for comfort and support. Yes, there were moments over the course of our continuing friendship. He acted as if I were his girlfriend. And although I didn't exactly push him away, I didn't cave either. If I'd long ago told Alex any of this, surely she'd have understood the predicament I'd often found myself in as an artist trying to make a go of it on so many fronts and all on my own. Surely she'd have sympathized and seen that I I couldn't, after all, have made it in this country entirely alone. Or perhaps she'd have seen something more sinister. Look, the point is, I hadn't let her in on any of this, and to do so now would be nothing short of foolish. Thank you. Great, thank you. So many things that I was noticing as you're reading that. Especially like how Priya, I mean, Priya just so often understates everything. She says something and then she like contradicts it almost immediately afterwards. She's like, you know, 
Oh, it wouldn't be a big deal. A whole book is how big of a deal this this relationship is, kind of. So it's very, I don't know. And also the bottles, there's the other bottles later on we have with Prakash and her, you know, there's all sorts of, I didn't really notice that motif until you reread that part. So it's very, it, it has a lot of the bigger story sort of contained in it, which I think is really wonderful. Um, well, you could imagine um, writing a character like Priya, who says one thing and she knows very well there's something else going on. So in the writing of it, like, I was exhausted <laughs> mentally. Yeah. Yeah, so, she, yeah, I mean, she seems like she's, like, so, like, in denial about a lot of things and just, like, trying to maybe, like, trick herself. So was it, like, how did you end up, like, finding and, like, deciding to put up with the exhaustion of writing a character like that? That is a good question. You know, I got, I did, she did exhaust me. And um, my, I have these these friends who were um, uh, reading the, the the manuscript as I um, as I was going uh, as I was writing it, and there were questions. Did you really want to get um, take up another voice? The reason that I brought Alex's voice in was there came a point where I thought, Priya, stop it, just stop <laughs> it. You cannot keep going back and forth like this. And um, and so I brought I brought um, Alex's voice in, and then we went back to Priya's voice, just for a break for me and for the readers. Yeah, no, definitely, it's like a breath of fresh air to kind of, and also like it's so interesting because you're so stuck in Priya's head that once you get to Alex, you sort of see, because a lot of Priya is just assuming what she thinks Alex is thinking, and so once you get to Alex, you sort of see what is confirmed and what is not confirmed. And then you're also like, well, is Alex also kind of in denial about stuff? And which is obviously probably also true. So it's very, it is a very refreshing kind of gift to the reader, I think. Also just to, to sort of have some mystery about Priya for a bit is I think a, a nice gesture. Yeah. Oh, what was it? I think I was gonna say something, but no. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, just kind of sort of going off that, I mean, you know, if I recall correctly to a previous conversation, prize when you started writing this book, like you sort of decided like, maybe I won't write another book and then you sort of found this one. Is that, is that true? It's true, yes. I, I had, um, I'd sort of, but the thing is, I have to confess that yeah. after every book I say that. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, I mean, the way I started the whole writing thing, you know, I came out of a visual art practice and I did not mean to be writing. I, when I wrote um, the first book, which was um, a book of short stories and then series blooms at night, I have to say, I loved it. I loved it. And, but I wanted to get back to my artwork and so on, but I loved it so much. I carried on writing. And then um, I, for the last novel, Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, uh, it, it was exhausting and, you know, I just decided, no, I'm missing photography, I'm missing painting and so on, and I'm going to stop. And a week later, yeah. I began Pool of Vortex, so. Wow, just a week? Yeah. That's so. So it's been a while. Yeah. Now, what I'm doing right now, so, uh, after Pool of Vortex, I have to say, I, I really loved writing writing Polar Vortex in a way I it's almost like when I wrote my first novel when I was sort of like because I hadn't planned to be a writer I um I was inventing how I would write this novel and writing Polar Vortex went back to that feeling and also I've had an amazing experience with my first publisher uh, a book hug I yeah. just really really love the engagement I had with them and with uh, Hazel Miller and Jay, uh, Jay Miller. Really, really um, nice. And they, they, are, they, have, um, they have contracted with me for a book of poetry. And uh, that's a pleasure. That's like, that's like going back to my art practice, but using lang verbal language. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. And your previous books were with bigger publishers, weren't they? Yes. And then you book hug is a book hug is a very small but very scrappy indie publisher. 
in Canada. Yeah, they're doing. And then Akashic, of course, is a great indie publisher yeah. in the US. Yeah. yeah, they're both doing a lot of um very interesting things, and you know, um, being um, nominated and winning big prizes. Not that that should really, you know, be of, but it is a marker of something, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, people take the press more seriously at the very least, so that's a a nice thing, you know. It's not like nobody's doing it for the awards. I hope. Yeah, because uh, you'll drive yourself crazy if you're doing that. Like, yeah. So it's just, it's nice to, but it's nice to see the recognition going more and more. I think towards the smaller publishers because I think they're just doing the more interesting work, and you're having the more interesting experience. You know, engaging with them editorially that probably is a a yeah. good sign. Yeah, they're paying a lot of attention to all kinds of details, and they're listening to you, which is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I'm sure you can find that in, in other places, but it seems like the smaller presses, they, they can't be doing it for the money, so they have to be doing it for like some sort of like deep love for, for literature and what they're doing. So it's really, you know, I feel very thankful that I had my experiences with Arsenal and Nancy, who are both pretty independent right. Canadian publishers as well. And it's just like, I, I don't think I would have wanted to start with someone that wasn't sort of giving me very much attention or very much care so i think it's yeah. a very yeah it's a very nice thing so how did you end up finding finding the book like what's your process like i think we you might have talked about this in our previous conversation but i'm kind of curious to yeah. well, hear more about how that happens I, I finding it is an interesting idea because i didn't go looking for anything yeah. Um, what happened was um, I, I had a friend who um, visited me um, f here in Prince Edward County and he actually told me this amazing story of his, his own life and what was happening in his life. And it was a beautiful story, a, sort of a love story. And he said to me, I mean, I'm sure you had this happen numerous times where people say, oh, you're a writer. Well, I have a story. Why don't you write it? And so he, this is what he said to me. And um, I began to write it. And there came a point where it wasn't what I wanted to do. Although I liked the story very much. It was kind of very sweet and, you know, not exactly me. So <laughs> I, um, I began to wonder about the two people, what was really going on in their minds and if one if one person says you know i love you so much you'd want to know why or maybe the other person is like not feeling the same thing or you know going along with it for his or her own reasons you know so that became really interesting to me you know all those kinds of devious little things and then once i started i couldn't stop once you get into the mind of a character like Priya, you have to, and you have to stay in character, every single thing she says and does becomes a question in the writer's mind. My mind. No. Yeah. 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 Well, that must be, I mean, also, if it's a really kind of, at some point, it must reach like a point of no return. Like, you're just so exhausted by Priya, but you're also like, I've already been with her so long I need to get to the end like there's no there's, I can't just stop now like I have to just keep going until the end I, I complain to my partner so many times whenever I was writing I say I can't I can't I just can't stand to be with her for one more minute <laughs> but there was another way that I loved Priya and um, felt a lot of what she was um, she was experiencing you know, particularly in her early days in Canada. I mean, you know, I'm, it is not my story, but I'm certainly drawing on my memory of certain moments in my, uh, you know, in my, my Canadian childhood. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I was very, for, for the first like third of the book, I was so frustrated by Priya, I think, and Alex kind of both, like they're kind of both, like, cause it's just like, it's just sort of like that they aren't being quite truthful enough or like clear enough about their feelings. And it's just like, it, you know, it's just going to end up badly. And I was so frustrated with Priya for a long time. And then I realized that the, I think the thing that I was most frustrated was by was how much I like felt, uh, like felt close to her in terms of like the way she's acting sometimes. I'm just like, oh, I'm just like annoyed that I'm having this reflected back at me, like the ways in which 
I also can kind of act like that. So I, I, I found the, I found that interesting at some point that I realized like, oh, that's one of the things that I find really difficult about Priya is that she reminds me of myself, which is kind of a funny, uh, a funny thing to add. So I'm kind of curious about, you know, you said it's not really your story. I'm kind of, cause you know, Alex is a writer, Priya is an artist. I'm kind of curious, like how you find writing fiction and where, like, how much you do blend in your own life because obviously it's probably like very much a hybrid and I think everything that someone writes is obviously a reflection of themselves right. and like every character is kind of a reflection of themselves but I'm kind of curious how it like do you intentionally maybe like borrow parts of like collage parts of your life into certain characters and yeah. other ones into other ones or how do how do you approach that? Well, there are a couple of things that um, one is definitely setting. If this setting is not um, really, uh, um, you know, extremely important, um, what what do I do so that it does it doesn't sort of um like weigh down my mind? I I might I might place it um, in some location that I know intimately, yeah. and. Um, there is no um, no lake behind my house. Well, the lake is so far away that you, you know, like you yeah. can't see it like right there. But um, so things like that would be added in because it made sense to do that, you know, because of the, um, the polar vortex and the effects that they saw and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, of the, of the characters, there's what I find myself doing yes i i draw on a kind of an a, a knowledge of an emotional um there's an emotional resonance that i can definitely tap into from um from different kinds of moments that i'm not actually writing but um there's you know something there that i will um also you know um as a writer and you must know this clearly is that we look at people very very closely and we see what what we we imagine we see what their reactions are not just their physical reactions but we imagine we see something else going in, on in their brains and you train yourself like that training not not consciously, but just because you're always looking. And perhaps out of various traumas as well, we, we, I, I might have trained myself, one trains oneself, to, um, to, to, to imagine what's going on in the other person's, how they're reacting, how they may react, what they're thinking, how you must react to what is going on with them. Yeah. And, so there's a kind of training, a lifelong training, I think, on various counts that come into play. Yeah. So, you know, um, writing a character like Priya in a kind of a way is easier. And then when I move on to writing this um, other character, Alex, a white woman, um, I obviously, you know, that is a bit of a stretch for me. <laughs> but... Um, that in itself is a an exercise that is very very interesting. Just like r writing Jonathan, the straight white man in Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab. Um, I might not get them right. I don't know, but um, the, I think the need to get it right is important to a point, but there's also this exploration for me as a human being who happens to be writing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I definitely connect with uh, the whole kind of like emotional resonance being the thing, like it's sort of like dismantling these things that have happened to you or these events and sort of like taking the parts and maybe changing them, like making them look completely different, but like the bones are the same. Yeah, I think it's, it's that's certainly the way that I feel like I construct fiction. And I think is, to me, feels like the point of fiction, because I also write poetry, and poetry is very autobiographical for me. I don't know how poetry is for you, but like that sort of place where I go to be more sort of explicitly maybe, maybe John or, you know, this is where I am. But with fiction, I'm like, I can, I can sort of look at these things that have happened to me 
and then be like, but this is the way that I can make them more relatable or not mm. you know, so more relatable, but make them sort of cleaner in a way that is more interesting to see as fiction, like instead of like the sort of intense messiness that might exist in reality if I were just to write like an auto fiction. I don't know, yeah. I feel like that's the way to you're, open it up. You're seeing it exactly. I mean, for me, um, fiction really is, it's all of that, but it's also me trying to sort things out where yeah. poetry is less of like um, trying to imagine, figure out how things work and so on, but more or less stating what I'm seeing. And by trying to pare things down, I'm coming to an understanding in a different way or to things that approach, um, I'm not going to use the word truth, but... <laughs> But it is an understanding that is clearer for me about how I'm seeing the world, whereas you know, um, um, fiction is trying to um, uh, trying to almost create the world. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, f poetry to me feels like a place where you go to be present in a way, like like being in a poem is being really present in something, and being in fiction is definitely like this huge like. I mean, yeah, that's the whole, I mean, I don't understand why people don't, I mean, it's just like, I, as a writer, I'm like, the whole, the whole joy is the invention, is the making this world, and is like, controlling the way that it works in order to like, give this, yeah. like, kind of, like, you're, you're able to sort of show theme through, like, manipulation of events and all of these things, like, you're, you're sort of a little, a little deity, like, moving things around and getting It's this, so good this, to speak yeah. with another writer. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I think also, and we were talking about like the messiness, because there's so much messiness between Priya and Alex, which I think is some of the, like I'm so I was sort of like really frustrated by them because they're just they're just just natting at each other like right at first like first while like they're just arguing all the time mm -hmm. and like not really saying stuff and like Alex seems super jealous in a way that just seems weird. And like we sort of eventually realize she may know more than we thought she did, but you know it's very interesting how you portrayed all that, but it didn't feel like unbelievable. And I think I was annoyed by how realistic it was. Almost like I was like, this is like, I was like, I can't really fault this because it's this is how it would happen. Like this was so, like the verisimilitude is there. Like this is this is life. I'm kind of curious how you you know, approach fiction in terms of that way, like how much of yeah. it is you like trying to really like you fall bend the love, roles to, to, you to, fall to, in to, love to with, yeah. um, you fall in love with Virginia Woolf and Elena Ferranti <laughs> and yeah. um, who else? Um, yeah, Rachel Cusack and so on. And you, um, and you want to, yeah, even like um, like um, uh, James Joyce and say like Ulysses and so on. There yeah. are there there are moments there that in all of those works that almost go nowhere and yet reveal so very much about the um about the characters about the character who is yeah. uh, speaking. You know the, the the protagonist and um, I. I can't tell you that I have a template for how to do it. And if I had a template, I'd want it broken because <laughs> then I, you know, yeah. it wouldn't work. Um, so it's in the moment struggling to get it right. And um, it's really trying to get into the character. And one thing I remember with, with Serious Blooms at Night was the first novel that I wrote, right? Yeah. And I remember um, realizing that um, Chandan Ramchandan, the father who abused his children, that I, there was a point where I began to read the book as if I were a reader rather than the writer of the book. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I realized that I could not, as a reader, feel anything for um, Mala because I didn't know anything about Mala, his daughter, because I didn't know anything about Chandan. You know, I didn't understand. It's like, yeah, so he abused her and that is horrible. But 
it didn't go and I needed it to go beyond that. I found myself getting into the position of um, Chandin Ram Chandin, which meant that in a kind of a way, I had to find that part inside of me that could possibly abuse a child um, for the sake of writing this character, not writing the abuse, but writing the type of person who would do that. Well, of course, at the end of this novel, I, it was as if I had gone into a very deep, dark hole and it took me a long time to come out. I knew that in writing uh, this novel, that I would be going to that place. And what my, my struggle was to go there and to learn how to come back out and to learn how to go back in as well when I needed to write out and not to, not to, not to, um, what's the word? I, I, I can't think of the word, but not to cheapen that journey back into the book at all. Yeah. No, I definitely, so lots of um, yeah. dinners and, and so on with friends in between. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, no, those are, the, it's, those are the difficult, I, yeah, I can't imagine having to do that, but it's sort of the work that you have to do in order to write, like to understand these people, yeah, you have to like really get inside them and try to figure out why they would do such a thing. Did you have to do that with Prakash in this book? Because he is kind of like, He's a very slippery character for a lot of the book. Like we kind of have this, don't know what to expect of him. Like how did you find writing him? Because he also doesn't get a point of view and is like the main right. sort of third person, yeah. What I wanted to try to do was to get him, to reveal him through Prakash, uh, sorry, um, Priya and Alex to try to get from the two points of view and create this person. And of course, he, when he comes into the room, he speaks a little bit and he tells us of his own experience. And then we get more of him at the end. But um, I really wanted them and, and Priya's memories of him and so on. The thing is um, uh, to create him, right? But the thing yeah. is that at the end, we find out that Priya's memories are probably not reliable. So we never really get to know Prakash. And my desire was that these three characters who have, um, uh, th they're all being a little bit um, tricky. Yeah. Um, that in the end that they read it, they, but you know, the, what I'm about to say, it's like you're writing this thing and then you get to the end and you come back and you actually really write it because you've discovered what you're writing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, at, at by the end of it, what I wanted was that the reader would catch that these, what's going on in these people, the real, very possible um, ways of being that we may even be like that ourselves, so that we not just have opinions about them, but we, um, like negative opinions, yeah. you yeah. know, look at what she did, look at what she did, look what yeah. he did. <laughs> we actually feel something for each of them that was my yeah. hope yeah no definitely i mean i found myself very much flip-flopping on prakash the, the more i learned the more stories we got and i'm like yeah he's a good guy and then me do something skeevy or something be like oh my god and then you do something i don't know and then he shows up with when in alex's point of view and all of a sudden he's charming and it's just like my whole world is like spinning trying to figure out you know what's going on and what to believe and i think it's a really interesting effect and and it's 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 where a lot of i think the tension comes is like you know the sort of trickiness of everyone you're kind of trying to piece together all these sort of co like conspiracy theories almost <laughs> about each other and like trying to piece together like through you know the different perspectives who is who and what and what is going on yeah so maybe we can have our our a little bit of Alex now. Sure, sure, and and you know, um, we should um say if if any of our, my dear friends out there would like to ask any questions, yeah, that might be a good time uh, to also you know send your questions in. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. We do have one question. Ah. Oh. Um, from S M M. As you were writing, did you know what Prakash's agenda was in coming to visit Priya? Um, 
That's a really good question. Now, when I wrote Serious Blooms at Night, I did not know how to write a novel. And I basically um, sort of drew on um, an art project. But, and who's the artist? I've forgotten who it is. I always forget his name. What's his name? Uh, anyway, he wrote this, this, um, this performance piece that goes uh, like this, um, take an object, do something to it, then do something to it, then do something to it. And in a kind of a way, I wrote Serious Blooms at Night like that. I, I didn't know where the story was going. And um, over the course of the other um, three novels, I tried to create a plot because I was told that's how writers write and it makes life easier and this and that and the other. When I went back to Polar Vortex, I wanted to discover the story as I wrote it. My friends love story and I went into this. I didn't know where it was going. I had no idea. In fact, I had no idea until the end what was going to happen. And uh, I mean, what's kind of nice is that in the end, that painting that I wrote, that I read about, uh, uh, you know, the, the first reading, yeah. that comes back. But um, at, at the beginning, when I was writing it, um, you know, the, there was the incident. It, there was no actual description of the, the, the work. When I got to the end, I came back and actually described the painting because, so that it would become important in the novel. So things like that. I, I really, really didn't know where it was going. And even at the end, in that those last scenes that are very, very breathless, I had I did not know. And it was in writing it. The thing is when you're writing, I can't say when you are writing such a sweet character. I have to say when I was writing who I one thing one thing was a result of the, the previous thing, it really was. And on and on it went. I mean, she was, you know, she was pretty dishonest in some places. Yeah. And what do you do with that? You have to kind of invent what next is going to happen very, very quickly. So, yeah, I didn't know. I mean, that's the most exciting way to write, I think. I'm just sort of the same way. I sort of, ha I sort of, I, I have a sense of an ending pretty early, I think, but I'm like, I don't want to, the more I sit there and plan, the less I want to write it. It just well, takes all the, all the energy and the fun out of it. Yeah, exactly. I do have this thing of don't think about it. If you do, you won't write it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have a, a follow-up question to that. So do you know now what Prakash's agenda was? Um, I, I kind of do. By the end of it, I have to know. I have to know what each character is doing, and then I go back and strengthen that, right? Mm. But I don't really want to say what his agenda was because I'll give the whole book away. But but I did have to know by the end. Yes. Yeah. Good point. So can we have that I, little bit, I of think, Alex? Now I think yeah. So sure. I think Prakash. I think Prakash had good reasons, you know, he was slippery and all of that, but he had good yeah. reasons in the end for what he did, not for what he yeah. did before the end. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so this is from Alex's point of view. And um, just before Prakash arrives, Alex, um, um, Priya has to drive it's an unfortunate moment for Priya because she has to drive their good friend Sky back to Sky's house. And she's worried that Prakash will arrive before she returns. And of course, he arrives at the house and um, the visit for the first few moments is, um, is a minute is fielded by Alex, right? Without Priya there. So um, they're in the kitchen waiting for Priya to return and Alex is cooking. When finally we heard the front door open, 
Prakash swiveled to face Priya as she entered the house, but remained planted where he was, and from him erupted a brilliant laughter. He outstretched his arms, and addressing both of us, exclaimed, Look at her! Look at her! Long time no see! Still, he stayed where he was. I gathered he wanted to share the reunion with me, so I leaned against the stove on my side of the counter and watched. Priya didn't take her jacket off or her boots, but came through the house directly to him. The warmth of his greeting was touching. He clearly wanted to hold on to her longer than she wanted. Priya was less effusive. She seemed less delighted than I'd imagined she'd be. I hoped this wasn't for my benefit. She said to him, you're entirely grey. I'm not grey, he returned, his voice seeming to feign a peevishness belied by the irrepressible grin he wore. He looked at me, an appeal it seemed, and I gathered the elaborate show of offence was a way of creating complicity among the three of us. He wore thin, gold, wire-rimmed glasses, and behind them, his eyes had turned misty. I thought I should turn away, leave them for a while, but I was more curious than ever about some obfuscated truth about their connection and did not want to miss any of this, so I continued with the task of removing skin from the blanched tomatoes as I looked on. After inane banter about what time had and hadn't done to them both, Priya commenting that he'd come to resemble his father, which he would beamed, he reached for and held on to both Priya's hands and attempted to pull her toward him. That was a bit much, a bit theatrical, I thought. Perhaps she did too, as she stepped in toward him for barely a second and then, rather oddly, pulled her hand away and, although it seemed mostly because of the smile she wore, as if it were meant to be playful, she gently slapped him. There was an intimacy to that odd gesture that I admit made my heart skip a beat. But I didn't want to succumb to petty jealousies. I needed, I'd earlier decided, to remain strong and focused. I couldn't have known for sure, but I thought hurt flashed on his face, despite the ensuing chortling, which I took to be a manner of defense. Priya removed her jacket and threw it around one of the chair stools at the island counter. She made her way around the counter as I slid the skinned and chopped tomatoes into the skillet with the softened onions. And with more warmth than there had been between us earlier in the day, she wrapped her arms around me and kissed my cheek. She had taken on the scent of his lime and leather cologne and that was like a fist tightening around my heart. To an onlooker there would, I'm sure, have been no hint in the swift and almost ordinary gesture for two people who lived together of the distress that hung like a heavy curtain between us. It is possible such warmth was an indication, a display, either to him or to me, perhaps to him and to me, of where her allegiances lay. It is possible, too, that in front of a third person, dispensing affection was less complicated, required less of us both than when we were alone. Her kiss on leaving the house with Sky earlier is a case in point. I just want to say that um, the audio book by, uh, oh gosh, by, by who is it? By Audible, by Audible. Yeah, um, read by Sharon Lewis and Iris Quinn. Um, they do an amazing job of Priya and, uh, and, and Alex. And um, cool. when I'm reading, I'm almost channeling um, uh, what's, uh, Sharon Lewis uh, as, I, I, as I try to remember Priya in my own voice. It's kind of amazing how well they did it. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, I don't have an audiobook of any of my books. I've, and it must be the weirdest thing to hear the voice in not your voice or not a voice that yeah. you've invented in your head. Yeah. Well, at first, at first I was a little um, peeved. How can they take my voice? How can <laughs> they possibly know? And I, 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 I resisted. I didn't, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to accept it. 
And then I kind of snuck back in when I was told, you know, it might be a bit late to change this. I kind of <laughs> snuck back in and listened and I thought, but they're doing it like how I imagined it. So what's wrong with me? And then I, I kind of opened up to, to it and was really blown away that they were able to get it. I think um, Sharon has a Trinidadian background. So she was able to catch my, my, um, my Canadianized um, uh, Trinidadian accent or, or cadence anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's, I can't, yeah, that must be so cool. Um, so yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about maybe your art practice and the sort of way that that intertwines with your writing. And you say, you do photography, painting. I don't actually know like exactly what your art practice is. So I'm kind of curious what that is and how you see your art kind of working sort of in concert or alongside your writing. Yeah, um, just hang on for one second. Yeah. Deborah, yes. can you look in my portfolio and bring the newest photo for me Where is your it's on the dining room table i'm gonna show it to you <laughs> cool um yeah there are i love the, the deborah's creeping behind me <laughs> <laughs> um i love what i am able to do in uh in writing that i can't with photography or in painting and they, they serve different um, purposes as well. Um, in the sense that um, when I am exhausted from putting all my energy into one, I can kind of move into the other and you know I go back and forth like that. Um, and also there are some things that, as I said, writing allows me to really kind of um try to mm, writing fiction allows me to try to open up find create some kind of imposed order yeah on chaotic uh things in my head situations in my head and so on what poetry helps me to do is to pull all the stuff away and try to get to um, to something that's quite clear. Um, my poetry these days tends to be about um, either family related stuff, my childhood and so on, and also um, uh, a lot of stuff about the environment, trying to understand what's going on in the environment. And um, um, photography and painting, I don't do any, I don't do any, um, what is the word? Uh, any a staged, kind of photography more recently a lot of photographers art photographers are doing staged work right yeah what i want to do with photography is photograph what's there and i think the more i'm doing it right now the more i'm realizing that it's really really urgent for me to photograph not just the landscape but um um i'm kind of doing portraits as well but these portraits are not of people they are of the things that belong to people. Yeah. And there is, f f I mean, it's interesting in Priya and Alex and Prakash, we don't know what is going on with them. But when we look at the, the um, can you, can you see this? Yeah. Can you see this? When yeah. we look, am I holding it right? Yes. Yeah. You might pull back a little just so we can see more of it, but yeah. There you go. Are you able to see Yeah. It? Oh, nice. Right, this one I did on the weekend. And when you see something like that, there's no lie there. It's the yeah. truth. And at this particular point in time, I feel as if there's so many lies being told that, um, and we don't know what the truth is. And I, I, I mean, that was harassing with my, my three characters. And um, what I want to do with photography is to, 
um, have work that um, that is you see what you see is what you get. And yeah. This is another one. Can you see this one? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. one allows me to absolutely state unequivocally what is there. I, I, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm using a camera that has 46 megapixels. And yeah. um, you, so when you shoot in RAW, you're getting something that's really quite dull, but has tremendous potential. Yeah. And when, um, when I work with that and this amazing um, printer I have, who then takes what I've worked with, and it's almost like an, the editor of a book. Not, not that he's removing anything or anything like that, but he is, he says, let's dehaze this. Let's uh, you know, bring out, if you dehaze the picture, the glass that is you know, with the picture behind it, we'll see the picture more clearly and, and yeah. things like that. And so we're getting more and more of what is there. Yeah. I, I love that more than, more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of a, getting into photography a little bit more lately. So I'm very, you know, shooting in raw, using, you know, doing all of that sort of fun stuff. So it's very, yeah, but very you're interesting. Doing portraits, yeah. Like actual people portraits, right? I mean, sort of. I mean, that's sort of the, I, I, I'd be very interested to do a lot more sort of stage self portrait. I, I'm very interested in self portraiture and like abstracting that just because I'm sort of obsessed with myself in a weird way. I don't know. It's sort of like poetry. I don't know. I'm very, I find it very playful and meditative to try to like create pictures. And I do a little bit yeah. of like, you know, walking around. I'd love to do some more like landscape stuff. And I think I just want to yeah. like really adventure more into that. Cause I think it's such a different like way of moving through the world. And I really like yeah. the, the, the idea of like the documentary sort of style that you're, you're going with. Well, when you're, um, when I'm writing, I have to stop this when you're doing this because there's so many of us doing it, with the, you know, like the different ways of doing things, but, yeah. When I am writing, I have to say I am often thinking also about the reader. I, one of the things that I try to do is to be a writer and reader in the moment. Interesting. That can be exhausting. When I'm behind a camera, there is nothing. I could be stepping back to get the picture and fall off a cliff. <laughs> and, and I would still be trying to get up the cliff to get the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that I'm... I think I'm sort of the same way. I mean, I don't, I just, maybe I, I'm more of an amateur when it comes to a lot of visual art stuff. So I like, I can't do it for anyone but myself because nobody cares for me. Right. So but it's, it's interesting to think, have to think of the, the reader as you're writing a book. I don't know that I do that. Maybe with fiction I do. I know that there's certainly things that I probably tweak or sort of like the way in which I, sort of take my life and fictionalize it. It's probably to the benefit of a reader. It's like, I'm trying to make interesting things from my life. And yeah. it's not, a memoir would not get you that because I just don't find myself interesting enough. Or but John, like I wonder if that is an age difference between us and when, um, what I'm thinking. And also um, the fact that I am an immigrant of color to this country. Yeah. And when I write, I realize that there are many audiences and yeah. in the days when I was um, coming out, there was a great deal of explaining I had to do. But I realized that I'm explaining to one group, say, say to, um, to people who are, were not uh, queer in its variety. Yeah. But also I was writing for those people, to those people. So I had to keep all these voices and all these questions you know, answered at, at one time. Does it, yeah. Can we see if anyone wants to ask any more questions? Are there any other questions? Yeah, do we have any other questions, Greg? Um, no other questions yet. Uh, oh, here comes gotta... one. <laughs> <laughs> From Surush Pat Jr. Uh, fascinating, your point about lies being told is profound, but how often do we ever really get what we are shown? in dealing with love and past love relationships. I feel like in life, we're almost always dealing with a facade. That's, that's definitely he, true. He might have written my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that sort of just reminds me of just how I think this so, and this is more just a compliment, just how beautifully you constructed this relationship with Prakash and just as maybe just my own relations to this book. It's just like, this sort of compli it's so complicated and yet so like raw and like there's no, I don't know, there's, it's one of those like relationships that I think many of us have kind of had where it's like, it's really intense and it's kind of fucked up in its own way but it's like I don't know it's you're sort of weirdly bonded to this person and it's so hard to get grow past that and and obviously like so much of Priya's time away from Prakash is trying to get past this and the book is sort of showing how you kind of can't get yeah, past so this so sort of unfinished she, business. So much so that she, uh, she, she, she encourages her partner to leave where they're living and move somewhere else yeah. I mean, that's like a big, big, big uh, manipulation there, you know, for her yeah. own uh, her own benefit. Yeah. No, she like, yeah, gets rid of her cell phone, like deletes all of her contacts. She has that great line about how like deleting Prakash's number is like taking a rototiller to her history or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But yeah. even that, you can't escape. I mean, like, I'm kind of curious about maybe like your idea of closure. Do you believe in closure? Maybe that can be our last question. <laughs> <laughs> closure. Well, um, cause that seems to be what Priya is kind of like yeah. appeal. No, because, yeah. because I think you may have closure in a minute, but yeah. next minute you're going to be thinking about it and you're going to be like, you know, um, yeah. revising that and you want to go back to it, yeah. you know? So, it's like, um, I'm done. I'm never going to talk yeah. to you again. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. No, I think that's totally the, the feeling that I have as well. So I'm glad God, I, I loved this conversation with you, John. And, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, my friends are all here. <laughs> yeah. Them. I can see them all. I'm so <laughs> yeah. I'm really pleased. Yeah. No, this was, a, this was a lot of fun. And I'm glad that everybody came to show up. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we'll we'll end with that temporary closure, <laughs> always to be continued. But um, wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> never stops. Thanks, um, William Greg. Yes, thank you so much, Shani. Thank you so much, John. Um, yeah. And thank you for all who attended and anyone who donated. We really appreciate it. And I hope someday we'll be able to host you both in the flesh in New York City. Um, at yeah. the very least, please come by and say hello. That's and um, yeah, I hope everyone has a lovely night. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>